so when we proclaim the name of Jesus, power is free. Welcome to New Dawn Community Church, the message of the week with Pastor Randall Cutter. Have an opportunity today to open up to Luke chapter 9. So if you'll open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 9. Today we're going to start with verse 38. As we are approaching the section of scripture that is in front of us, it's good for us to remember where we've been. Last week we saw Jesus sharing with the disciples how the keys of the kingdom are activated. Without any doubt, we've gotten the hint that Luke is a book about Jesus initiating the kingdom of God and challenging his disciples to live in the kingdom of God. He sent them out to be able to do the things that he was doing and to preach the kingdom of God. He gave them the authority over sicknesses and demons. They were to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And when they came back, they did not get off duty. Jesus wanted to teach them more. They failed the test at the feeding of the 5,000 when he told them, you feed them. And they're like, How would we possibly do that? Forgetting that he'd given them the authority. And then, as he shares with them more about who he is, he lets them see what it's going to take for him to step into his authority. And last week especially, we saw him looking at his disciples and saying, if you're going to follow in my path into the authority that I have for you, you're going to have to walk in my path. You're going to need to take up your cross on a day-to-day basis, dying to your own self-will, in order to be able to step into the true authority that I have for you. And then he gave three specific reasons why doing it our own way doesn't work. And we talked about that last week. If you weren't here last week, I'd go back and I'd listen to that Uh, video or the podcast of it. Both are available on our website because Jesus explicitly tells us what we can expect to happen if we try to do it our way instead of his way. And none of the endings are good. There's only one way to step into true authority and that way is to do it the way that Jesus outlined for us. So Jesus has given the disciples the dying to self message and then he reveals his glory to several of them along the way. By the way, if you're looking ahead in the book of Luke, when you're at Luke chapter 9, you just look over the next chapter or so and you'll see there's a heading in the NIV. It says, the disciples argue about who is the greatest, which means they weren't getting the message. But that's the same way we are. It takes us, we hear about dying to self. We hear about taking up our cross and following Jesus a lot and we still don't get it. We think we have to do it our way rather than the way that he has outlined for us. And that is not the path to to authority or power in the kingdom of God. So, anyway, today we are looking at Luke chapter 9, starting with verse 28. And I think I said 28 before. might have said 38. It's 28. And um, we're going to look at it. We're going to see Jesus, who has accepted the path that the Father has laid out for him, we're going to see a little bit about more who, about who he really is. And so today, verses 28 through 36, I've just entitled it, Seeing Jesus, and obviously it's seeing him for who he really is. Reminder, the sections of scripture that I'm going to be projecting today, unless otherwise shown that it's from other, some other verse, are um, the scriptures that I'm showing are my translations of the scriptures And the reason I do that is because, number one, it helps me to be able to teach them at a higher level because when you digest something by translating it, it makes it a part of you. And uh, secondly, there's some nuances and things that is, it just helps me to be able to bring out a little bit more clearly. However, I would suggest that you have your favorite translation open in front of you so you can see the nuances and you can see the differences in the translations. So we're in Luke chapter 9, verse 28 right now. About eight days after these teachings, Jesus took Peter, John, and James up onto a mountain to pray. While he was praying, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing was flashing like, or white like lightning. Okay, so we've got, after these 
things about eight days after these things. These things, of course, were Jesus' teachings, these statements that Jesus was making about the way that you are going to step into authority in the kingdom. And Jesus has just started to tell them, I'm going to go to Jerusalem, I'm going to be rejected, I'm going to suffer, I'm going to die, and then I'm going to rise again. And right after bringing them that revelation, about eight days later, he actually shows them who he really is. And that, you know, they did not understand the true nature of his glory. They needed to see it so that they would understand that the path he was walking was the way for that glory to be revealed in the area in which we live on this earth. And so the disciples needed to see who Jesus really was. By the way, Matthew and Mark uh, both say after six days, it was after six days that he took them up on a mountain to pray. Luke says about eight days. And there's, we think Matthew and Mark were doing that because uh, Moses went up on the mountain to meet God. And it says after the sixth day, on the seventh day, God met him. And so we think Matthew and Mark, who were writing, you know, who were, who were Jewish, were picking up on that six-day theme. Moses goes up a mountain, meets with God. Jesus goes up on a mountain meets with the Father, and so they were tying in by saying after six days. Was it after six days? Yes. But Luke's a little bit more accurate and says it was about eight days, somewhere right in there that they were doing this. So it was about eight days, and Jesus takes his inner circle up on the mountaintop, Peter, John, and James. Jesus had different layers of people around him. It's just the way it is. He had broad following of disciples. And then he had, it, it just came down to different groups that would travel with him at different times until you get to the 12. I mean, there were 72 that he sent out at a different time, but you get down to the 12, and then when you're with the 12, you get down to the three that he was pouring into at a very high level. I was honestly thinking Peter, John, and James, and then I thought, wow, James is the one who gets killed right away by Herod. Think about that. Jesus was pouring into James only for James' ministry to be cut very short. Isn't that interesting? Do you think that that was a surprise to Jesus, that his ministry was cut very short? And the answer is no. I think it's a clear message to the people of God that we need to be able to, you know, we pour into people no matter what we think about their future. The second thing is that, obviously, by making James one of the inner circle, no one could ever accuse James of bringing his death on himself. And I'm, I'm just saying, people... Look at what they did to Job. So Jesus was going out of his way in that sense too. So they went up the mountain, by the way, in Scripture, when the, the idea of going up the mountain, I've already mentioned it, it's the idea of going up to meet with God. Elijah went up the mountain. He went up the mountain of God, met with God up there. God says, what are you doing here? Because Elijah was going to resign. And God's, you know, he had to ask that question twice of him, saying, what are you doing up here, Elijah? This isn't the time for you to be up here. So, while Jesus is up there, he's praying. Luke is pointing out again how much Jesus is involved in prayer. Remember, he had spent a lot of time in prayer before he talked to his disciples about the path that he and they needed to walk to get to the glory. So, um, while he's up there, the appearance of his face changed, and his clothing was flashing white like lightning. Matthew says that his face shone like the sun. So the appearance of his face certainly stopped being what we think of when we look at someone to something that you couldn't even look at. And then his clothes became so bright, it was flashing white like lightning. It was just a very different scene for these disciples to see. And obviously the whole thing was to reveal Jesus' glory. By the way, um, this is called the transfiguration. Luke doesn't use the word, but Matthew and Mark do. They say he was transfigured before them. The Greek word is metamorpho, and it, it means to be changed, to have it's the, the metamorphosis of the butterfly. It's, and by the way, we are supposed to be changed also. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Be in meta, be, you know, let the renewing of your mind metamorphosis you into something that is going to look more like God. Same thing. Jesus is transfigured. What's on the inside of him is coming to the outside of him. When Moses came off the mountain, he was reflecting the glory of God. 
different thing on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus' glory that was on the inside was being revealed to those who were around him. And more was going on than just that. Incredibly, verses 30 and 31, incredibly, two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glory and were speaking with him. They were discussing his journey, which he was about to bring to completion in Jerusalem. Now, when I use the word incredibly, a lot of translations drop the little particle. That's the word that was often in the King James and some translations. They say, behold, or lo, or whatever. And that's Luke's way of saying, wow, pay attention to this. And so I use the word incredibly for that. A lot of translations drop it because they think it just isn't necessary, but this means that Luke was drawing attention to this event and saying it was an incredible thing. Pay attention. Look. So incredibly this thing happened. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glory and were speaking with him. Now, we've got Moses and Elijah and we got them showing up looking very glorious too. That's this is, I mean, Luke wanted to make sure that we understood that they didn't look just like they did when they were on this earth. They also were reflecting the glory of heaven while they were there. Why Moses and Elijah? Hmm. There's a whole lot of thought. You know, some people say, well, Moses represents the law, Elijah the prophets. That's Probably they're most well-known, you know, Moses going up on the mountain receiving the law. But Moses was a prophet, too. You do know that. <laughs> Moses was, was, in fact, sometimes at a much, he had a much higher role as prophet than Elijah did because Moses received from God and gave it to the entire nation establishing its course. Elijah was more of a, uh, a corrective prophet, if you will, along the way and then was given some very great privileges along the way. Two of the most well-known Old Testament characters, of course. Um, Moses is the one who said, there's going to be, you know, God is going to raise up for you a prophet like me. Okay, remember that? And so Moses shows up, basically, I believe, to be saying, this is the prophet like me, for those of us who are able to see with New Testament eyes, that this is the prophet like me that Moses is coming to encourage Moses came to initiate the, uh, what we now call the Old Covenant. And Jesus, of course, he's meeting with Jesus, who's going to initiate the New Covenant. Elijah was the one who was prophesied who would come. This is in Malachi. Elijah is the one who was prophesied who would come. He would come before the, great, before, before the Messiah came. In fact, it was expectation in that time that Elijah would come before the Messiah would come. In fact, it's still expectation today. So in the... In, uh, Jewish circles. So, and they were having a discussion. It's interesting. I translated it. They were discussing his journey simply because of the fact that that's probably the best way to translate it. Um, however, if I wanted to be very literal, I would have changed it to they were discussing his exodus, which he was about to fulfill in Jerusalem. Because the Greek word is exodus. However, the word exodus means a mass migration in the English language. And so it doesn't really fit for a translation. But as long as I'm explaining it to you, I can change it to it. They were discussing his exodus. Now, there you've got Moses. Where did Moses do all his stuff with God? Oh, in the book of Exodus. And by the way, it's the same word in the Septuagint, exodus. Okay, which is the Greek language. So they were discussing Jesus' exodus. Moses had his exodus. Now Jesus has an exodus. He has, and in the language of the day, it often meant departure. Some of your translations will say departure. The end of his journey, they were discussing his journey is the way that I translated it because it doesn't always just mean the end of a journey, but obviously in the context, they're talking about what's going to happen in Jerusalem and he's going to fulfill or complete his journey there. He's going to fulfill his exodus there with what's going on. And so basically they're having a chat with Jesus about what's going to happen between that mountaintop and the time that Jesus is on a hill called Golgotha giving his life for the world and they were speaking to him obviously bringing encouragement at some level from the heavenly throne room so that he could set his face like flint and continue on the path the journey the exodus that had been arranged by the father for him and which he had volunteered for and so Jesus now is being reminded or being encouraged I should say he's the one that's been telling the disciples about this. 
so that they would understand more about what it was that his true role was. And this is, you know, when we think about it, um, the disciples didn't get it. When we look back at this, we understand the plan. We understand how Satan's kingdom was going to be defeated. Satan didn't understand it. Satan still doesn't get it. When we die to self, it is just, it's the way that we, when we suddenly, Satan sets us up for temptation again and again. And the way we get around it is by dying to our own self-will. That is how you defeat temptation. You consider it dead. Whatever the temptation is, you consider it dead. You are, you are baptized with him into death so that you may rise again and lead a new life. That's the picture of how we are connected to Jesus. We overcome in the same way that he overcame. And the disciples, of course, didn't understand that. But for us, that's life-changing. We come to Jesus by dying to our own self-will. We love to be the ones who are in charge of our own fate. We're the captains of our fate. And yet, when you're a Christian, you've already determined that if you're the captain of your fate, you're going to destruction. And you realize, hey, the, the Father God has provided his son and had him shed his blood to initiate a new covenant. And I come under that covenant by receiving Jesus as my Savior. And by recognizing, and by the way, that's an act of dying to your own self-will. You're admitting your need. That's called repentance. Agreeing with God that his way is the right way. Your way is not the right way. And we come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ and we continue, it's by faith from first to last, we continue walking in this life by the same type of faith that we walked into it. And our faith grows and we continue walking in faith. We continue dying to self. We energize the kingdom in our lives by dying to self. That was what I talked about with last week's message. So they were discussing Jesus' exodus, which we are fairly familiar with, but the disciples didn't know what was going on at that particular time. And now we are at, Luke reveals the secret to his readers that all of this rejection and suffering and death was going to take place in Jerusalem. They were discussing his exodus, which he was about to take care of in Jerusalem. Now, what were the disciples doing during this entire thing? They were being his disciples. Peter and those with him had fallen asleep. Okay, now I just want you to think about this for a minute. Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. They sit down, get comfortable, and they fall asleep. And one of the most exciting things in their lives was about to happen. And it was preceded by a sense of sleepiness. That's amazing. I think it's part of the, the, the power that was coming on the mountain may have made them heavy. But Peter and those with him had fallen asleep, but they jolted awake and saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As Moses and Elijah were leaving them, Peter, who did not know what he was saying, said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. So, um, the picture behind the Greek language is that they were weighted down with sleep. You, got, you know how that is, right? Don't you, you, first, that feeling of lethargy comes upon you. You can hardly move. You don't want to get up, and all of a sudden, you're gone. That's where they were. They were gone. However, they started awake. They jolted awake. It's that picture of all of a sudden you are asleep, and you're like something startles you, and you're wide awake. They went instantly wide awake. They saw what was going on. Peter uh, did not quite get his wits together before he opened his mouth, but that's not the first time. Peter, who did not know what he was saying, isn't that nice of Luke to remind us, uh, tell us that, right? He did not know what he was saying, um, started to jabber. He wanted to prolong the experience. You can understand, they woke up and there's glory everywhere, and he has seen Moses and Elijah, and somehow he understands that's Moses and Elijah, and maybe he was told right in the middle of the experience. And he's like excited. This is like, you know, you don't, this does not happen every day. Yeah, there's Jesus in all of his full glory, and there's Moses and there's Elijah. Wouldn't you want to stay up there? We, you know, Jesus has been telling us about rejection, suffering, and death. That sounds pretty ugly compared to what we're experiencing up here. And so Peter says, hey, let's, uh, let's stay up here, and I'm going to build some shelters. Um, 
three-tenths of meeting, basically. Let's just build shelters for each of you so that you can stay. It, this, the Greek word could be tent or shelter. It's booth. It could be the, the same word is used for the Feast of Booths when they built those temporary little shelters. Uh, it could be used as the tent of meeting to also. So they, he's thinking, let's just keep this thing going. Maybe we can charge admission at the bottom of the mountain. And people can come up and visit. You know, Well, of course, he didn't know what he was talking about. That wasn't in his mind. So, um, while he was saying this, a cloud appeared and overshadowed them. The disciples were frightened as they entered into the cloud. A voice came from the cloud and said, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. So the cloud interrupts Peter's babbling. It's like the father wanted to say, Just hush. Because you don't know what you're saying. Keep your mouth shut for a moment. It's the cloud shows up. It's, it's to like, here we are. Stop. And the, fa- the father says, this is my, the father shows up. First of all, he encompasses them in the cloud. How much can you see in a cloud? No, not much. No. And they were very terrified by this because suddenly this cloud moves in and they can't see hardly anything because this cloud shows up. And uh, if the father's presence is in the cloud, that's, pretty weighty all by itself. That would be being in the presence of God. Yeah, I can understand why they were frightened. And so the voice said, this is my son, obviously speaking about Jesus. Uh, The the voice of the father shows up several different times, obviously at his baptism, at another time in front of a crowd to to honor Jesus and to, to let the crowd know that the father was honoring him. And also now with the disciples so that they might understand more about him. This is the son. He says, this is my son, my chosen one. And my chosen one is pretty significant because of the fact that it is, a, well, it's from the book of Isaiah. In 42.1, it says, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I'll put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nations. Now, That's written in Hebrew. My chosen one, when you bring that into the Greek language, one way that you can do it is by saying, my beloved one. If you look at this phrase in Matthew, it'll say, this is my son whom I love, beloved. But here, Luke, who is writing to Greeks again, uses the words, my chosen one, because Greeks wouldn't have understood that beloved is the, in the Jewish mind, is the same as my chosen one. It's the same type of status. And so Luke goes back to Isaiah 42.1, pulls out the meaning from Isaiah 42.1, and lets the, so it communicates to the Greek-speaking people to whom he's writing. This is my son, my servant, whom I uphold is from Isaiah, my chosen one. And the father says, Peter, instead of talking, why don't you just listen to him? The word listen can mean obey. The same word, just like, just like you need to listen to your mom and dad. Okay? You're not saying you need to hear what they're saying. You're saying, obey your mom and dad. And that's what the father is saying to Jesus. Pay attention to what he is saying. Now, by the way, this is my son, my chosen one, um, <laughs> the Lord, this is Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. So the father, by saying, listen to him, is tying us back to Moses, who was just on the mountaintop. You need to pay attention to who he is. Because he's got some life-giving things. You need to obey him. You need to listen to him. Now, years later, this is just a little excursus. Years later, Peter would be reflecting on this particular incident. And you can understand, if you went through this, you'd be reflecting on it too, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. You know, might write a book about it. <laughs> okay, so anyway, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter's talking about this incident. He says, We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
For he received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice that came from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. By the way, we really don't know where that sacred mountain is, but it's, everyone would like to know where it is. And we have heard the word of the prophets made more certain, and you will do well to pay attention to it as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation, for prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. This is interesting when Peter does this, and it means something for us, because right now, God is pouring out his Spirit at a very high level, and there is a danger is the danger is that people can start to honor their experiences more than they honor the word. Happens all the time. They have an experience that is a clear contradiction of the word of God, but it's their experience, their vision. And it's because of our built-in hubris, it's, it's like we automatically know that there's no way we could have misunderstood it, and there's no way that sometimes God just gives us experiences so that we will check the Word of God and compare it to the Word of God and find out what the Word of, drives us deep into the Word of God. Peter's saying, you know, I had this experience. It was up on a mountaintop with Jesus, and we heard the Father speaking. But guess what? We've got the Word of God made more certain in the Scriptures. And let me tell you, why is it more certain than even our visionary experiences? Because the prophets were carried along by the Holy Spirit. He led them so that they would write down the very things that God wanted them to communicate. Peter is saying that it is the Scripture is even more vivid, and more important than his personal visionary experiences that he was communicating. Now, by the way, Peter became an author of Scripture. But as he wrote that, he wasn't thinking of himself as an author of Scripture. He was simply saying, as I look at Scripture, I make sure that I'm not letting my visionary experience trump what Scripture says. And this was already a problem in the early church. Paul had to say, hey, don't let someone who's you know, really proud because of their visions of angels, don't let them take you out by their you know, talking about all their visions. Don't let them tell you things that are, no longer, that are not true because they're going to go in great detail about their experiences, about their visionary happenings. And if they don't have Scripture to stand on, or if they contradict Scripture. So I, I want to just take a moment because this was something that Peter was very clear on when he was talking about this very experience that he had. We have the Word of God more certain. We have the prophets made more certain through what is written and not through just our experiences. Okay, so now back to the main message today. When the voice had finished, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept quiet and did not tell anyone at that time what they had experienced. Um, it says in, I think it was in Matthew, that they fell face down to the ground during this time when the Father was speaking, and they were encompassed by a cloud. They couldn't see anything. So it's really interesting wording. When the voice had finished, they found that Jesus was alone. What happened is the cloud dissipates and they look up. That's how they found that Jesus was alone. And uh, it says in one of the Gospels that Jesus actually walked over and tapped them. Because you know, they're like face down. It's like, hey guys, it's time to go. Let's go. And they look up and Jesus is alone. Okay, so they found that. Um, they realize, oh, look at that. Jesus is here. And Jesus, we're told in one of the other scriptures, one of the other Gospels, that he tells them, don't tell anyone about this. Which is why Luke just said the disciples kept quiet and did not tell anyone at that time what they had experienced until after the resurrection. They didn't understand it. On the way down the mountain, Jesus says to them, you know, he's talking to them again about his suffering and death and about his exodus and his journey. And the disciples fall back away from Jesus. And Jesus had said, and I'll rise again. And the disciples are talking to each other, the three of them saying, what do you think it means when he says he'll rise again? 
What does that mean? Because they were looking for a metaphor. They were looking for a parable. The idea that he would die and rise again didn't get through their heads until he rose again. Now, Luke drops the next little section that we're going to do today. Matthew doesn't. And this is an important discussion for us about the days in which we live right now. Because what Matthew adds looks ahead to the time in which we live as we are in the transition between ages. We are at the time of the transition between the church age and the age of the kingdom. How do I know that? Because Jesus says, we'll we'll get to it eventually in Luke, he says, Jerusalem will be trampled by the Gentiles until the age of the Gentiles is fulfilled. 1948, Israel was declared a nation. They fought some wars. Jerusalem was trampled by nations from 70, the Gentiles, from 70 AD all the way past 1948 because Jerusalem was not a sovereign city governed by the Jewish people for quite some time after that. Many people think it was the 1967, some think it was the 1972, whatever. We definitely get to the fulfillment of Jesus' words where he said Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until. That is a 2,000 year old prophecy that for the most of that 2,000 years the church looked at and said, huh, I wonder what that means. Because obviously Jerusalem is never not going to be trampled on by the Gentiles. That's what 2,000 years of church history did. 1,500 years of it. They didn't get how that could possibly be. And in our day that scripture was fulfilled. Now, you got to pay attention when stuff like that happens. Jesus, the sovereign of the universe, that's, by the way, our Savior and our Master, made a prediction. He said, when you see Jerusalem no longer trans- or trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, that's going to be an end of an age. Ergo, we're living in a transition between ages which explains a lot of the insanity going on around the world. It's just the way it is. So, this will help us as we look at what Jesus and his disciples discussed on the way down that mountain. The disciples asked him, why do the scribal scholars say that it is necessary that Elijah come first? Uh, That was... uh, From the book of Malachi, Elijah was going to appear before the Messiah. This is the scripture in Malachi. Look, I am sending Elijah the prophet to you before the great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn back the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers so that I will not come and devote the land to destruction. So, his role was turning hearts. Now, let's just look at that scripture. If... If the Elijah to come before Jesus didn't fulfill his role, what was going to happen to the land? It was going to be destroyed. So what does 70 AD tell us when Jerusalem was destroyed? He did not fulfill his role. The hearts of the fathers were not turned to the children. And the hearts of the children were not turned to the fathers. The Elijah who was to come before the Messiah did not get it done. Not because he didn't do his part. Because the people did not receive him. And Jesus is about to make that very clear. The results of not the hearts not turning fathers to the children and children to the fathers would be that the land would be destroyed and the very fact that the land was destroyed within 40 years lets us know that the role did not happen and the land was destroyed. So, the disciples say, why do the scribal scholars say that Elijah has to come first? This is what Jesus says. He responded to them and said, on the one hand, Elijah is coming and will restore all things. But on the other hand, I tell you that Elijah has already come, but they did not recognize him. Instead, they did what they wanted with him in the same way the Son of Man is about to suffer under them. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them about John the baptizer. This is extremely important, and in most of your translations, it's mistranslated. From the time I was a Greek puppy... 
I knew about men day. There's a little particle that's M-E-N in the English language, and then it's followed by the word but in the next sentence. And from the time you start learning Greek, you know if there's a men here and a day there, it means on the one hand and on the other hand. That's what it means. Now, most of the time, you don't translate it that way because we don't like that type of pedantic language in the English language. But you've got to communicate it. You've got to somehow communicate it. And most of the translations just drop it because they do not understand what Jesus is saying. Because look at what Jesus is saying. It sounds very clear to me. He says, hey, on the one hand, Elijah is coming and he will restore all things. What is the time frame? Future. Elijah is going to come and he's going to restore all things. They are correct in what they're saying. It's going to happen. So on the one hand, what they're saying is true. On the other hand, it didn't work out the way that we wanted it to right now. Why do you think Jesus could begin to prophesy about the destruction of Jerusalem? Because he saw how Elijah was treated. Who was Elijah? It was John the Baptist, John the Baptizer. So on the one hand, Elijah is coming. But on the other hand, I tell you that he came and he wasn't received. And as a fact, because he, wasn't, because he came and he wasn't received, we're going to go through this very awful birthing pains of the church and of the new covenant. Now, the reason that most translations don't translate it on the one hand or on the other hand is because if you read the commentaries, I'm telling you again and again, they look at it and say, Jesus is obviously not saying that Elijah will be coming before the end of the age. But it's obviously what he's saying. It's obviously what he's saying. And there are commentators that, of course, agree with that because it's obviously what he's saying. And so I, if I had a Bible that didn't have this clearly spelled out, I'd be putting it in the margins personally. Because he's saying Elijah is going to come. That means before Jesus comes again, we expect that spirit of Elijah to be released on this earth in the same way that it was released through John the Baptist. There's going to be a voice crying in the wilderness saying, prepare the way of the Lord. A, a voice that this time is going to be heard. How do we know it's going to be heard? Because Jesus is going to stay in heaven until all of his enemies are made a footstool underneath his feet, which means that which he has released on the earth is going to, there's going to be, it's going to happen the right way. And so right now, pay attention. Because when the spirit of Elijah is released, you're going to start hearing more about the kingdom of God. You're going to start not just hearing about the kingdom of God, you're going to start to see the works of the kingdom of God being done on higher and higher levels. And it's not just going to be in one place. I believe that this spirit is going to impact because the church is a different animal than the Jewish people were. They had one in the Old Covenant. I believe when that spirit goes forth in the New Covenant that we're going to see that spirit impact everywhere. And we're going to see kingdom messengers raised up. And they're going to be raised up so that the hearts of the fathers turn to the children and the children turn to the fathers in the church among the wheat. Remember also the age that we live in. And this one explains a lot about what's going on right now. Have you noticed, by the way, the insanity that's going on in our culture? But you know, it's not just in our culture. It's around the world. And the parable of the weeds and the wheat, the, the, the parable of the weeds and the wheat was simply this, the, that God sows seed, the enemy sows weeds, and as the enemy sows weeds, they both come up and they look the same because immature weeds look like immature wheat and vice versa. And so God says, don't pull them up. Some of them are just immature my immature people, and some of them are weeds, but you can't tell the difference right now. I mean, think of all the times that you've looked like a weed in your life. <laughs> okay, let's just face it. That's why we have something to repent of. 
And even after we come to Christ, we can still have weeds in our lives. You know, things that, have, that, that look like weeds because of the fact that we're dealing with our flesh. And so the Lord says, no, let's all have it come to maturity. You know the difference between weeds and wheat at maturity? Wheat is bearing fruit and their head, its heads bow. It's bowed down. Weeds stands up tall. And when you think of a picture of how can you tell the difference between weeds and wheat in the area in which we live, the wheat, the wheat becomes more humble. And they serve the Lord. The weeds become more arrogant and proud. And in our culture, we're seeing some of the most insane stuff is that insane pride is released all around us. I'm still not willing to call someone weeds or wheat because they could get saved in an instant. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly identify someone as a wheat, but I'm really hesitant about the weed appellation. We are living in a time that has been prophesied for thousands of years. Jesus' very words. And it's important for us to understand the type of message that we can expect to go out. With the spirit of Elijah being released, we're going to hear that kingdom message more and more. Pay attention. You're not just going to hear it here. You're going to hear it when you're watching shows on television, when you're watching, you know, whether it's you know, God TV or TBN or whatever it is you're watching, you're going to hear more of the kingdom message. You're going to hear more of what God is doing to change the kingdoms of this world into the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And we're going to see his plan work out through us if we'll keep our heads bowed in humility. Because he can use us. And we'll bear abundant fruit. Amen. Seeing Jesus is about seeing far more than his physical appearance. It's about seeing his plan and his purpose and his heart to release his glory through us. It's about seeing his true plan being worked out in our day. Not just looking back to a historical event, but looking forward to what he is doing right now and being a part of it. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity to look into the scriptures and find out more about what it is that you have revealed to us about the day in which we live. I ask that you would give us insight and understanding. Shake up your church. Stir it up, as we were praying earlier, so that the message of the kingdom, which will take over the church, you said that in the parable of the leaven and the lump, but Lord, we ask that that would happen quickly so that your life can go forth to this world. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.